Hello everyone, DM Gashbad here, and today we are back to the world of Warcry. Specifically, first edition Warcry with the solo narrative campaign The Rat Hunters, based loosely on the Vermintide video games. An army of Skaven have invaded a city, and in their desperation, the populace has turned to my warband to help defend them. In the first three games, you choose an area of the city to defend. In game one, I chose the Ironweld Armory, and I successfully defended slash looted the smithies and arsenals there. In game two, I've chosen the Dockside Alleyways, so I'll get to that in a little bit, but first let's meet my warband. I'm using a Slaves of Darkness warband led by a Dark Oath War Queen named Haldora Hell's Daughter. Haldora is the wife of Leaf the Legbiter from my Warhammer Quest campaign, and this is the story of what happens when she wanders into a Northern Empire town for a little vacation with the rest of the boys while her husband's off campaigning. In the last video, I accidentally referred to the group, which I hadn't named yet, as Haldora's Explorers. And I was gonna delete it. I thought, oh no, I shouldn't say that. But then, the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. And so, yeah, now that's the name of the group. This is Haldora's Explorers. Besides Haldora herself, we also have four flail marauders. The Warcry miniatures all have their particular names. And really, I'm just gonna keep referring to them by their old Warhammer Fantasy names. We have a single Knight of Chaos with an ensorcelled hand weapon, we have two Chaos Warriors with hand weapon and shield, and we have two Marauders with hand weapon and shield. The Marauder with the blonde hair has a Blast Powder Bomb, which we picked up in the last game. The Blast Powder Bomb can be thrown 9 inches, and the target and everyone, friend or foe, within 3 inches takes d6 wounds on the roll of 4+. plus. The Knight has a healing potion, and the Marauder with the flail with the top knot on his head, he got a destiny level so he can re-roll one of his attacks once per game. That's 1,000 points of Slaves to Darkness recruited by someone who doesn't know a thing about Warcry. Let's move over to the Skaven side. The Skaven Horde gets bigger with each game, so we're up to 950 points for the Skaven, so we're just about even. As before, it's led by a Claw Leader and has three Clan Rats, two Gutter Runners, and a Warp Fire Thrower. It also has a Packmaster with two Giant Rats, but since we've gone up 150 points, I've added a third Giant Rat to that pack, and also added a Scryer Acolyte, which is the new fancy word for an old Poisoned Wind Globadier. So why a Globadier and a Giant Rat with my 150 points? Well, with the models that I have, I really had about three options. I could simply add two more Clan Rats, I could upgrade the Claw Leader to a Claw Lord, add in a Giant Rat and a Clan Rat, or I could do what I did with the Globadier and the Giant Rat. Thing is, after the first game, I'm really sick of clan rats. There's something about them that I do not care for. Lots of movement, high toughness, and just kind of annoying. Plus, the Globadier is a new model. I just want to see what it does and have it out on the table. And so here's the table all set up and ready to play, and now I gotta talk about why it took me a couple months to get the second game of this series out. We're fighting in the dockside alleyways, and I could have just put a bunch of buildings on the table, had a table set up much like the game before, and been done with it, and it would have been fine. But I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cooler if I actually had some docks? So then I started thinking about it and thinking about it, and I thought, yeah, yeah, I gotta do that. The good news is that I did talk myself down from actually making a full dock system. In the end, I just used some of my old Mordheim bridges to represent them. The thing that I couldn't talk myself out of was that I needed a way to lift the rest of the board up so that you can see where the water is. So I decided I was going to make this giant 22-inch square platform to raise everything up so there's a nice drop-off leading to the docks. So if I was building and painting that, that meant it had to get done after all the other projects that I was working on. Blah blah blah, two months go by. But here we are! And I absolutely love how it looks, so I don't regret this at all. I put a bunch of my old orc ships from a long time ago. I think I built those for the first scenario in the old Dark Shadows campaign for Warhammer Fantasy. It was the scenario where you had to make this beach landing on the shores of Albion with all your troops, and you had to have these little boats to do it. So I crafted up all these orc and goblin ships. So I guess we know that Captain Scumdrop's pirate orcs are somewhere in town too. This also helps add to the flavor of the town. It's definitely a place where all sorts of riffraff show up and hang out, sort of like a northern Tortuga. And so I've just named the place Nortuga. So this is the story of the defense of Nortuga. And so that got me thinking that after I finish this campaign, maybe I should run through another one with the pirate orcs to see what they've been doing. And that meant I had to go and order the old Harbingers of Destruction book for Warcry so that I could use their rules. With all the stuff that I have, why do I always find myself making myself buy more stuff and paint more stuff? 
Why don't I ever just have the things for the projects I'm trying to do already? The good news is, is that I built a little sewer entrance into the sides of this big platform that I created, so I don't have to paint anything new for the next game in Warcry. And I've been rambling long enough, let's talk about the actual game. The victory conditions for this game are no mercy, meaning that the game immediately ends once one side has been brought down to half their starting strength or less, and the other side is the winner. So since the Skaven have 12 models on their side and my guys have 10, that means that the game will end when the Skaven take 6 casualties or I take 5. There's no turn limit on this victory condition, but at the end of round 4 and every round thereafter, anyone within 4 inches of a table edge instantly counts as a casualty. We have to roll randomly for a twist, and on a 1 through 3 we get Eerie Silence, which is no effect, but I roll a 4 plus and we get Deluge, which means it's raining and all ranges are reduced to a maximum of 6 inches. Well, that does restrict the range of my new Blast Powder Bomb, which is a little disappointing. I think it's probably a net positive, because the Skaven side does have those gutter runners with their throwing stars and, of course, the Warp Fire Thrower. Finally, I have to draw a random deployment card and I get Knife to the Back, which is interesting. The Hammer and Shield groups are pretty straightforward. The Hammers deploy 6 inches out from the center of the long table edge, so kind of right in the middle. The Shield deployment points are directly 6 inches to the right of those points. For the blue player, this isn't a problem. They've got a nice open area to deploy in and they won't have any trouble joining their two groups together. For the red player, not so much. For them, the shield deployment point lands right in the middle of that large building in the upper left. That means the only place they can really deploy is on the left-hand side of that big building, which means that there's this big chunk of impassable terrain between them and their other group. And as the shield group is where I put both warbands largest concentration of fighters, including their leaders, whoever gets the red deployment is going to have a real hard time consolidating their forces and bringing their power to bear. Now I could have changed this, I could have moved where the building was a little bit, or even used a different piece of terrain, but I liked the way the board looked and, you know, it's a 50-50 chance. Maybe I won't have to deal with this at all and the Skaven player will be divided like this and I'll have a nice easy game. I think you already know where this is going. No, I'm the red player, so I gotta deal with that situation. Finally, the dagger group is going to come in on reserves in round 3, which is kind of late, and they come in on half of the long table edge behind the opponent's two deployment points. This is kind of unfortunate in a number of ways. First off, for the Skaven's dagger, I gave them the Packmaster, the Gutter Runner, and the three giant rats. I would have much preferred those guys to have been on the table from the very beginning so I can kill off those really squishy giant rats and drive up the casualty count. Now instead I have to wait for round 3 and so I have to focus on the tougher Skaven elements. Second, my dagger group has my knight. And while on the one hand he has a nice high movement so that he can get right into the fight when the time comes, he's one of my more powerful models and I'd really rather have had him on the table from the beginning as well. Going over the rest of the deployments, that dagger held in reserve, it also contains one of my marauders with a flail and one of my marauders with a shield. The central hammer group of mine at the top contains my Warrior of Chaos, a Marauder with Flail, and a Marauder with a Shield. The Marauder with the Shield has the Blast Powder Bomb. So on the one hand, I love how all these Skaven are going to be converging on that point to possibly get blowed up by that bomb. I feel like if I don't do something, they're going to get overwhelmed really quickly. And then my Shield group, which consists of Haldora, a Chaos Warrior, and two Marauders with Flails, they're going to show up too late and end up having to fight the whole Skaven force by themselves. So my plan is I'm going to deploy that Hammer group just a little back, and I'm going to try and get the first turn so I can pull one of my Shield people out, most likely the Chaos Warrior, and draw the closer group of Skaven towards my Shield group. This isn't ideal, I'm breaking up the big group so that the Blast Powder Bomb won't be as effective, my hammer group is still going to get overwhelmed because they'll be facing the Skaven shield, and the Skaven with their ranged attacks and the ability to do their charge special maneuver are probably going to be able to throw attacks this first round where I am not. But it's the best plan I could come up with at the time. In the bottom center we can see the Skaven hammer which consists of the Poison Wind Globadier, a Clan Rat, and the Gutter Runner, and off to the right we can see the Claw Leader, Warp Fire Thrower, and two Clan Rats. You may also notice that no one has ended up on the docks or the boats that I spent all this time setting up, so I could have just ignored that whole terrain project and moved on with the game, but oh well. 
Here we go, round one. I roll my six ability dice and I get four singles and a double two. The Skaven, of course, don't roll dice. They just count as always having three singles. So this is great. It means that I get the initiative and I can bank my wild die for a later turn. In accordance with the plan, I move out my Chaos Warrior. I have to use both of his move actions to do this, but I'm now closer to that hammer group of Skaven than my hammer group of Slaves to Darkness. Over to the Skaven, the solo play rules don't give you any instruction as to what models to activate for the Skaven, so I just activate the one that's closest to one of my guys. In this case, it's going to be the Clan Rat and the Hammer group, and so we have to roll on the chart to see what he does. He's not in weapon range, so he rolls on the far away chart, and he rolls a 1 or a 2, and so gets Recuperate Move. So if he had any damage, he would have healed 5 hit points, which is kind of a lot, and then he makes a normal move. He was undamaged, so that doesn't come into effect, but he ends up right there. There was a chance that if he had made a double move and ended up in contact with my Chaos Warrior, one of my Marauders with Flails could have been able to throw some attacks on him. But it would have been a little bit wonky, and so I think this is going to be okay. The other thing is, is that those other two models in the hammer group have ranged attacks. They're all going to be clustered up there as they toss attacks into my Chaos Warrior. That could be good if my Marauder from the other group could break away and throw the Blast Potter Bomb at them. But in the short term, it's going to mean that they're probably going to get attacks on my Chaos Warrior. He's probably tough enough to take it. And my guys are going to be too far away to really get up close to those guys this round. Back to me, unfortunately I didn't take a picture of this, but Haldora Hell's Daughter herself, my Dark Oath War Queen, is going to take a double move and move past the Chaos Warrior a touch. Over to the Skaven, and the next closest is going to be that Gutter Runner. It gets the charge result, which means that it gets a bonus move action. The only good news is that doesn't bring it within one inch of any of my guys, so I don't get the automatic hit that would otherwise occur. It does mean that it now has a full two actions to throw throwing stars at Haldora. The good news is that those throwing stars are a lot less dangerous than the gutter runner's melee attacks, but still it gets two dice to throw in the first attack and rolls a crit and a hit for a very respectable four points of damage. He does completely miss with his second attack action, so I guess it's okay. I want to hold off on activating my hammer group until some of those Skaven move up to them. Hopefully they'll get to counterattack, throw their bomb, that kind of thing. So I activate my destiny level flail marauder and he just moves up behind Haldora with a double move. Back to the Skaven, they activate their Poison Wind Globadier, just gets a basic two actions, moves up, and this is what I didn't really want. Those Globadiers just have one attack, and they got a real specific range between three and six inches, but that's where he finds himself. And that one attack does a lot of damage. It's also strength four, but thankfully Haldora is toughness five, and so it misses. So good news. If I can get in close with that guy, he has a much weaker melee attack, and there's not really an option for him to back away. So that's what I'm going to try and do in future turns. My turn, I move up my final Flail Marauder from the Shield group, back to the Skaven, and they activate the first Clan Rat from their Shield group. It gets a standard double action, and so move moves right in front of my Chaos Warrior, which is exactly what I want. If I had the option to, I would have rather held off on this next activation, wait for a couple more clan rats to get up there so I can fight him. But if I did that, I'd just basically have to waste one of my Marauder's activations. So I'm just going to go with the Chaos Warrior right now, and I'm going to use my double two for an onslaught. So he gets plus one attack dice to all his attack actions. I have gone between games and researched the abilities a bit more. I do have the option on this guy to instead increase his strength, which means he's hitting on threes instead of fours, but I think the extra die is more useful, especially since with the Onslaught, the first attack action I get, I get a crit and two hits, and so immediately destroy this clan rat in front of me. Great start. Very happy about this. As I feared, though, it does leave me with one action where I can't really do anything too useful, so I just use it to move a touch over to the left clear the way for my Marauders. The important thing with that move is I'm staying over 12 inches away from that Warp Fire Thrower, so I don't get shot with that. Back to the Skaven, the next Clan Rat also gets just a basic double move, and so it goes right into that Chaos Warrior, another rat for the Meat Grinder. I next activate my Marauder with a Flail, who is just within 3 inches of that Clan Rat. Those Flails have a range of 3 inches, which is insane. Can you imagine a bunch of drunken northern barbarians wielding flails with chains longer than spears? Someone's been watching that Witch King from the Lord of the Rings movie and thinking, yeah, that's what I want all my guys to be running around with. 
Anyway, he does real well on his first attack, getting a crit and a hit for four points of damage. He does miss with his next attack completely, but still it's a good start, half health for this clan rat. Then it's the Skaven Claw Leader's turn, and he gets just what I don't want him to get, which is the charge result. So he gets a full six inch bonus move. Again, at least he can't do that automatic damage on my guy, but he does get two full actions after that. So he moves up to my Chaos Warrior, Thankfully, he is just barely outside of one inch range, so he uses that final action to move straight into him like that. So that could have been a lot worse. The thing is, these Skaven are a lot faster than I anticipated. I kind of thought that they'd all clump up in the center of the board, but that six inch move of theirs, they are on my case right away. So this Blast Powder Bomb might not be as useful as I'd hoped. I've only got one activation left, and it's the Shield Marauder with the Blast Powder Bomb. Because of the way I deployed those two, I can't sneak past my own Flail Marauder and get towards the Skaven Hammer group and toss the bomb into them. I could move around the Marauder and do a normal attack into the Claw Leader, which isn't terrible. But what I do instead is I use the Wait action. So I'm going to hold off, see where that Warp Fire Thrower ends up, and then hopefully it's going to be in a place where I can throw the bomb at him and get these other two Skaven. So final activation for the Skaven is the Warp Fire Thrower. It just gets its double move action, which is what I want. That's just fine. And it moves up right behind those other two guys, which is closer than I wanted. So now it's my Marauder with Shield's turn, and I have to figure out if I'm going to throw this bomb or not. The thing is, if I throw it at the Warp Fire Thrower, it's going to hit my Chaos Warrior and my Marauder with the Flail. Or at least it might hit. Everyone gets hit on a 4+. And again, because I waited, I no longer have two actions, I only have one, so now I can't move around and attack the Claw Leader like I could before. So while odds are I'll do more damage to the enemy than myself by doing this, it's real chancy. And it's really easy to see how it could go really, really wrong, but I go and do it anyway, and it pays off. So all five of those models are going to take d6 wounds on the roll of a 4+, plus. I roll for the Warp Fire Thrower... I get him and do the max 6 points of damage. Same with the Claw Leader, also takes 6 points of damage. I don't hit the Clan Rat, it would have been nice to have killed him off, but oh well. I do hit the Chaos Warrior, he takes 3 points of damage, he's got 15 health, he can afford it. And I also managed to miss the Flail. So yeah, got a bit lucky there, but that flank definitely needed it. I'm feeling a lot better about that situation. So round one is over, we're over to round two, roll the ability dice, I get double threes and double fours, meaning I only have two singles, which means the Skaven are going to go first. Still, I think I'm okay with that because I believe I'm in a position to really make good use of Haldora's special ability, Spurred by the Gods. It does mean that I have to use a wild die to make a triple, but with a bunch of enemies and allies all clumped up together, I think now is the time. I am going to have to weather the first attack from the Skaven, and the two models that are closest to my guys are the Clan Rat and the Claw Leader fighting my Chaos Warrior. Unfortunately, the Claw Leader goes first, but still the Chaos Warrior is pretty tough and I'm not too worried. Unfortunately, the Claw Leader then goes and rolls the Deadly Strike result, which it means it just drops an automatic D6 wounds into a model within one inch, and he rolls the maximum six. So there's six points of damage straight into the Chaos Warrior. That changes things a bit. He's up to 9 wounds, only 6 wounds remaining. The good news is he has a toughness of 6 compared to the Claw Leader's strength of 3. So the Claw Leader needs a 5 to 6 to hit. He's got 4 attacks and he completely misses with his first round of attacks. But then with his second round, he goes absolutely nuts, gets 2 crits and a hit for a total of 10 points of damage, and down goes the Chaos Warrior. And that is the problem with this AI chart and with Warcry in general. These models can absolutely spike a ton of damage on you. So now I think I'm in trouble. I was counting on that Chaos Warrior to kill off a model on its activation. I was hoping that he would hold up these guys and keep them alive for a little bit longer. But now it's really looking like that flank is just going to get killed sooner rather than later. And with each side now having one casualty, the race is on. So now I'm real worried about how long those Marauders are going to last, so I'm going to activate my Flail Marauder before something terminal happens to him, and I'm going to use the Onslaught on him to give him an extra die. As we found out with that Blast Powder Bomb, I know I'm within 3 inches of that Warp Fire Thrower. It has 6 health remaining and a real possibility of melting either of my Marauders if it gets a chance to fire. So if I can get a little lucky here, I'd like to kill that guy off. 
So I roll four dice for my first attack and they all miss, only needing fours, but still no damage whatsoever. And so now I'm in trouble. My second attack does a little better. I get a crit and a hit for four points, leaving on two health remaining, but not what I needed. Skaven turn, and the next closest Skaven is the clan rat in front of Haldora. It gets a recuperate move, which is fine, really. I wasn't particularly worried about Haldora, but hey, I'll take it. So the rat recuperates and then just steps forward to Haldora. Back over to me and I activate Haldora Hell's daughter herself. And in accordance with the plan, I go and use Spurred by the Gods. So all those guys there are going to get an extra attack die when they attack. And as far as I can tell, Haldora is a friendly fighter within three inches of herself, so she's going to get the extra die herself. She doesn't have the greatest profile for a Chaos Leader, but I think it's more than enough to butcher this clan rat. She does okay with her first set of attacks. She gets two hits for a total of four points of damage, but then in her next set, she only gets one hit. So the clan rat's got six points of damage, still has two health left. A little underwhelming. Next up is the Gutter Runner who gets that Death Strike ability. The good news is that he is in range for his attack, but he's not within one inch to do that automatic D6 wound, so it's okay. Again, he throws those throwing stars at Haldora. The first set misses. The second set gets a crit for three points of damage, which is fine, but they're chipping away. Next up, I activate my one remaining Chaos Warrior, and he is mad, mad, mad. He's going to move up in between that... Poison Wind Globadier and the Gutter Runner and throw his attacks into the Gutter Runner. The Gutter Runner has a lot of power on the offense, but not much on the defense. And my Chaos Warrior goes nuts and kills him in one attack action. There you go, a little revenge for my fallen pitman. The other thing I'm happy about with this move is that now I'm nice and close to that Poison Wind Globadier, who is a lot less dangerous at close range. Or so I thought, because the Globadier is up next, and he also gets a deadly strike, and he is within one inch, so he's going to do that d6 points of damage straight through my Chaos Warrior's armor. Luckily, I only take one point of damage from that. He's then stuck just punching my guy. He does manage to knock one more point of damage through, so this could have been a lot worse. So my next activation is a little tricky. I have a little bit of a traffic jam over here with the shield group. In the end, I go with the Marauder with the Flail with the Top Knot. He's in range of the Clan Rat, who only has two health remaining. I think with four attacks, I should be able to kill that guy off. The bad thing is that if I don't manage to do it, then I've kind of trapped my other Marauder, who I'd rather have moving out and attacking that Globadier. But I go for it, and with my four attacks, I only do one point of damage. Fortunately... That's my guy with the level of destiny. So I'm going to go, I'm going to get the reroll, and I get the hit through, and so that clan rat dies. Cool, everything's going according to plan on this side of the table, not the other side, but at least this one's going well. We've killed off our third Skaven halfway there. His second action is just spent moving out. He's actually getting kind of close to the Skaven in the shield group, so maybe he'll be in a position to help out my beleaguered hammer group. Speaking of Skaven Shield and my hammer, the next closest Skaven is that Clan Rat. He gets the Recuperate Move action because he's on the far chart. That does wipe out that four points of damage I put on him earlier, which is disappointing, but it does mean that he's not throwing any more attacks into my warriors. He's also now just barely within one inch of my Marauder with the Shield. So I'm going to spend two attack actions just stabbing past my Marauder with Flail at this Clan Rat flanking us. He does pretty well, really. His first attack does one point of damage, and then his second attack does two more. So this Gaven's taken three points of damage, still not as much as he started with, but what can you do? Next up is the Warp Fire Thrower, and he also gets Recuperate Move Attack. So five damage goes away from him, very disheartening. He turns the nozzle of his Warp Fire Thrower onto my Marauder with the Flail and completely misses. All ones and twos. I will take it. And for my last activation of the round, the Marauder with the Flail moves up and puts two points of damage on the Poisoned Wind Globadier. So that's it for round two. On to round three and the reinforcements arrive. First up, we get a bunch of Skaven that have just surrounded my hammer group, those two lone Marauders there. Yeah, those guys are gonna die. I do make a little bit of a mistake on the deployment. I misread the card or misremember it. Those guys should actually be deployed a little bit over to the left. It's not really going to make a whole lot of difference. 
They could have deployed anywhere along that left-hand side of the long board edge. I figured the easiest way to do it is just to deploy them as close as possible to one of my guys. And here come my guys, hopefully ready to ride in and save the day. For the ability dice this round, I get triple threes and double sixes. I've got two wild dice, so there's no way that I'm actually going to be able to steal the initiative. The Skaven are going to go first. So I have a look through my abilities, and in the end I decide to make that triple three a quadruple three, and also turn one of the ones that I rolled into a double one. So I've got a quad and two doubles. There goes all my wild dice, but hopefully this will be an important turn. Unfortunately, the Skaven get to go first, and out of the gate is that clan rat that's been causing me problems. He manages to roll that deadly strike behavior again, which is just killing me. He's attacking that Marauder with the flail, and he rolls his d6 and gets 5 points of damage through. Bad, bad news. He fires his first round of attacks, gets only 1 hit for 1 point of damage, so that's okay, but his second group gets a crit for 3. 9 points of damage from a lowly clan rat. I told you these guys are rough. The only good news is that my Marauder has 10 health, so I'm just barely hanging on with one point remaining. So that guy's in a lot of trouble. Better activate him while I can. In fact, might as well use one of these doubles to give him Onslaught as well. The Skaven have taken three casualties. I need to cause three more to end the game. I've got these giant rats behind me, which are real nice targets. I've got four attacks. I'm going to be wounding them on threes. I do one three damage. If the dice come up right, I can maybe kill two of these guys with this Marauder with the Flail. Unfortunately, my first attack round only does three points of damage. It's got one health left. That means I have to use my second attack action to finish that guy off. Of course, on that one, I roll a crit and two hits doing five points of damage. Would have killed a giant rat outright. I specifically target the giant rat that I do because I want that giant rat that is attacking my Marauder with the shield to be next. Because he's one of the least dangerous models that the Skaven can activate. So I'd like him to be alive and give my guys more time to rack up the casualties. Oh, but hold on. Did I say that that giant rat is one of the least dangerous models in my opponent's army? I take that back. It just gets its standard move attack, move attack behavior, but on its first attack, it crits for three points of damage, and then on its second, it hits and crits for another four, dropping seven points of damage onto my poor Marauder with shield. Those two guys only have four health between the two of them. But here, my knight comes to save the day. I'm going to spend the quad, and I'm really looking forward to this. I've never used this before. It's Rampage. And the more I look at this, the more I think this is what I should have been aiming for with my wild dice this whole time, getting these Rampages off. Because it gives me a free move action and a free attack action. Yes, I could have made a triple and used a trample and go and smash the Globadier and then move on to the Warpfire Thrower, but I think this is better. I think that Globadier is going to die one way or the other. This is what I want to do. So, with that giant movement of 10, the Knight thunders past the Globadier and into the Warpfire Thrower. Then, with his free attack action, he does 6 points of damage to that Warpfire Thrower. Not enough to finish him off, but definitely a powerful strike nonetheless. Then he has his two normal actions. He uses the first to kill off the Warpfire Thrower. That's great. I only need to cause one more casualty to end the game. Unfortunately, the knight's not going to do it because he's not in range of any other enemies. But what he can do is use his last action to move straight into this crowd of Skaven surrounding my Marauders. So now he's the closest model to a bunch of these guys, including the Claw Leader. Hopefully with his armor and hit points, he can absorb the strikes and keep some of those guys alive. Back over to the Skaven and I have to randomize which model gets to strike next and I get the giant rat in combat with the Chaos Knight. Perfect. Less perfect, this stupid rat crits my knight for 3 points of damage and then on its second attack action does another 2. So now I'm thinking maybe this wasn't a great idea and I just made the same mistake I made in the last game of throwing this knight into a really dangerous situation. Because that claw leader and gutter runner are still left to go. But I have a chance to rescue the situation. I'm going to activate my chaos warrior next and I'm going to use my last onslaught on him. So that's all my ability dice expended. But that is going to give him four attacks with each of his attack actions. Going at this poisoned wind globadier. Hitting on threes causing two points for a normal hit and four for a crit. The globadier has six health remaining so as long as I don't roll a bucket load of ones and twos I should be okay. And the chaos warrior makes it happen. First attack action does a total of eight points of damage and kills the heck out of this globadier. 
With that, the Skaven have lost half their number, and as Skaven do, they break from the combat and run away. My guys have won. That was a gnarly battle. At any point, it looked like one of my guys was going to fall over and die, or that Hammer Group was going to get overwhelmed. But in the end, we actually did really well. We only lost one model, and that was the Chaos Warrior. So despite getting all that damage from those deadly strikes and a couple of points of damage from my own bomb and having to deal with that big building in the middle of my deployment area, Haldora's Explorers did real well. So now on to the aftermath phase, and the most important role that I'm going to make is the casualty role for my Chaos Warrior. So on a 2 or 3 on 2d6, that guy dies, but not only does he not die, he lives like he's never lived before. Gets a double 6 on the chart. He comes right back and comes back angry. The next thing we do is roll four destiny levels and the bonus for completing this scenario is that my guys get a destiny level on a roll of a four plus instead of a six. So all of my surviving guys get to roll and we do pretty well. Both of my marauders with shields get a destiny level. The flail with the top knot gets his second destiny level. I also get a destiny for the marauder with the flail and the dagger as well as the chaos warrior with the top knot and Haldora herself. Don't get it for the knight, which would have been nice, but really can't complain with that set of rolls. Finally, I get to make two rolls on the lesser artifacts table. There's some good stuff on this chart, but I don't think I got it. The first item I get is a jar of chamonic glowflies, which adds one to the value of abilities that I do. There's not many abilities that I have where the value of it even matters. My knight is really the only one with the useful ability that uses that, and he's already got an item with his healing potion, so I end up giving that to Haldora. There's an ability somewhere that may come up. The second artifact I get is a little better. It's a chronomantic dial. I give that to the Chaos Warrior with the top knot. It's a consumable. Would have rather had these perishables, but oh well. If I consume it, I can add one to my attacks characteristic for a game. Since there's only two games left, I guess that's actually pretty good. And so that's it. We're halfway through the campaign and my group is doing fairly well. The fights are going to get tougher from here on in though. The next game is going to be at the Northern Sewer entrance where I have to do the assassinate mission against the Skaven army that's 1,100 points. And then the last game, uh, I'm not even going to talk about that just yet. That's going to be real hard. But hopefully I won't make you wait too long for those. Leave a comment below if you have any questions, observations, or concerns. And I will see you on the next one.